Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today we're getting enthusiastic about ergativity. But first, next month, November, is Lingthusiasm's anniversary month. It's been seven years. For our anniversary month, we ask you to share your favorite episode or just share some Lingthusiasm in general. Most people still find podcasts through word of mouth, and a lot of them don't yet realize they could have a fun linguistics chat in their ears every month. Or in their eyes, since all Lingthusiasm episodes have transcripts. So we're asking you to help connect us with people who would be totally into a linguistics podcast if only they knew it existed. The other day, I shared our color episode with a stylist because we were talking about the strange history of the color orange. Ooh. It's so fun to find that perfect episode to recommend to someone, and we've touched on so many different topics over the last seven years. And I'm always sending people to our episode on turn-taking and conversational styles because there's this comment that keeps coming up on social media about having to hold up the entire conversation by yourselves or not being able to get a word in edgewise, and that's a linguistics thing that's been described, and you can listen to an episode about it. We've asked you to do this every year on our anniversary, and we always see it in the stats, so your recommendations really do help more people find the show. If you share us on social media, you can tag at Lingthusiasm on basically all of the social media sites, so we can see it and reply or like it or reshare as appropriate. If you share it in private, we won't necessarily know, but you can feel a warm glow of satisfaction. Or you can tell us about it on social media if you still want to be thanked. In what is becoming another anniversary tradition, we are doing our second listener survey this year. This is our chance to learn all about your linguistic interests, and we have a new set of linguistics experiments for you to contribute to. If you did the survey last year, the experiment questions are different this year, so feel free to take it again. You can hear about the results of last year's survey in a bonus episode, and we'll be sharing the results of the new experiments next year. This year, we also wrote an academic article about the process of making Lingthusiasm, which featured some of your answers from the previous survey. So you are officially contributing to academic research. And because of this, we have ethics board approval from La Trobe University for this survey. To do the survey or read more details, go to bit.ly slash Lingthusiasm survey 23. That's all lowercase and with the numbers in their numeric values, not written out as words. (laughs) Or follow the links from our website and social media. Our most recent bonus episode was a recap of Gretchen's time at the 2023 Linguistics Institute, which is a month-long linguistics summer course. Was I jealous? Yes. Was I delighted to hear about it? Yes. Go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm for this and many other bonus episodes. Our patrons really do let us keep making this podcast, so we really appreciate any level of support. You know, Gretchen, in some ways, ergativity is the basis of our Lincoln friendship. You know, you're right about that. So I think it started in 2014, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I had been getting a sort of higher than usual number of questions about linguistics topics on my blog, All Things Linguistic. And I decided, look, I don't have time to answer all of these, but I know that there are other linguists on Tumblr who do sometimes have areas of expertise that I don't, or maybe just have more time. And so I put this post out saying, I want to try to be a bit of a connecting point for people who have questions about linguistics topics that aren't currently very well explained online, and then to encourage people who had answers to those to either write a blog post or especially contribute to Wikipedia for those particular topics so that there'll be sort of better information about various linguistics topics on the internet. And I was in grad school at the time. So while my supervisors probably thought I didn't have the time, I certainly had the enthusiasm. (laughs) And someone had specifically asked a question about ergativity and said, look, I've read the Wikipedia articles about this, but I still feel confused. Can anybody help me understand this phenomenon? And look, we can definitely say that this was to answer the question that someone had asked. But also, I found it really helpful to write this incredibly long form back to first principles blog post about what ergativity is to really help keep it in my mind while I was working on some of my coursework for grad school. So it benefited everyone. And it also allowed me to see where there were some parts of the Wikipedia page that I could contribute to. So those edits are still up there as well. Amazing. And subsequently, I did some more Wikipedia workshops, and I reached out to you to get involved with those because I saw that you had edited Wikipedia before, and I was like, ooh, this person seems responsible and reliable, and maybe I can 
<laughs> Nerd stifer into doing more things. <laughs> she blogs. She Wikipedia's. Uh, and eventually that led to the podcast. And it's all because I'm a bit of an ergative devotee. An ergativity devotee? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So I recognize that we are saying the word ergativity a lot and we're not explaining what it is yet. And I promise we will get to that. Mm -hmm. But I yeah. also want to point out that ergativity has a certain level of linguistic cultural cachet. This is true. It's a term that's only used in linguistics. And it's one of those things that you can sort of throw into conversation and you'll sound like you know some linguistics if you say it in an appropriate context. So we are here to give you the ability to casually toss ergativity into conversation. And my favorite example of that currently, although who knows, there could be more examples in future, I hope there are, mm -hmm. is an XKCD comic called The Tower of Babel. Um, I think we should narrate it. Okay, dramatic reading of an XKCD comic. Let's do this. So first of all, there's more than two characters in this comic, so we're just going to it, – it, it'll be fine. We'll make it work. Uh, one of those characters, though, I should point out, is a curly-haired linguist mm. who bears a striking resemblance to you. I will be playing that character. Yes. Gretchen will be playing Gretchen. <laughs> uh, Lauren will be playing all of the other characters. Great. Okay. We ready? Yeah. The Tower of Babel is complete. Let's go meet God. Hi, God. Oh, wow. Nice tower. You did a great job. I'm so proud. Thanks. I'm going to give you a reward. What do you like about the world? Hmm. Words are really cool. Oh, God. No, wait. Great. I'm going to give you lots of languages to study, each with its own phonology, word ordering, morphosyntactic alignment. Yes! Oh, we should not have brought a linguist. <laughs> uh... So technically, the curly-haired linguist character is not named, but mm -hmm. I think of her as a kindred spirit. Um, and morphosyntactic alignment is the broader concept that ergativity is an example of. So this is going to be an episode where you can listen to half an hour of explanations. You can understand two words in a comic strip. Are we ready? We are so ready. And if you don't retain every bit of detail about this, don't worry. I was multiple years into a PhD before ergativity really clicked for me. The thing to really retain is that sentences have this organizing principle that's different in different languages. If the exact details are something that takes a while to sink in, that's totally okay. We are going to explore some cool languages doing cool stuff this episode. All right, let's start with English just to give ourselves a bit mm -hmm. of a of grounding. So when you have a sentence... Let's take a very basic sentence, Gretchen visits Lauren, yep. which is a thing that has happened. And obviously, we need to distinguish that from Lauren visits Gretchen. Which in English, we do by the order that the words come in. Right. And this lets us know, you know, who's going to Australia, who's going to Canada. Otherwise, you could end up buying some very confusing airline tickets. Mm -hmm. And we could also do a version of the sentence that doesn't use names. You could say, I visit them, they visit me. And here we have both the word order and the form of the words themselves, I versus me and they versus them, that's telling us who's doing what to who. Very convenient. Thank you, English pronouns, for helping here. If I visit them, I can say I arrive and we have I at the start of each of those sentences. In English, we wouldn't say me arrive right. or them arrive. But in principle, we could. Right? Like it would be confusing if we started going around saying like me visit they, because then you wouldn't know which of the clues to follow. But it actually is not confusing to say me arrive or them arrive instead of I arrive and they arrive, because there's only one person or entity doing a thing in each of those sentences. Yeah. So when we have two different people or groups acting on each other, when we have two different roles in the sentence, we need to distinguish between them grammatically, either with word order or by changing the shape of the word. But when we only have one person or group, one role doing an action, then that solo entity can kind of cluster with either of the forms in the sentence where we have two of them. We should use some kind of visual metaphor here to help show the relationship between these three different roles that you can have in a sentence. So I first learned this relationship between roles by having somebody draw a little triangle on a piece of paper with these three different possible roles and doing mm -hmm. a circle around like which ones are clustered together in which language. I did that on my blog post and I love using some very nifty color coding when I teach this with slides, but uh, 
we don't have access to that. This is an audio podcast. Mm. Um, so instead, we thought we would send everybody something in the mail so you could have a visual. Oh, we could launch a massive advertising campaign. Imagine the day where we have morphosyntactic billboards in Times Square. We could just, you know, all of the bus shelters, we could just pay for advertising so you can see this diagram if you're listening to okay, this podcast okay, while you're um, walking the dog. I think this may <laughs> this may be getting out of hand here. <laughs> You know, because we have such a massive budget, Lauren. Mm, I am going to have to break the sad news to you that we're going to have to use something that is a little bit closer to home and a little bit more on budget. Okay, okay, okay. Let's try. Um, if you look at your hand. Uh-huh. Or borrow someone else's. <laughs> or borrow someone else's consensually, if you like. Um, we can put these two people with their two roles in the one sentence on two different fingers. Okay. So if we have Gretchen visits Lauren, we can put the doer, the visitor, that's me, on the index finger. Yep. And the visitee, that's you, Lauren, on the pinky finger. Great. Okay. I've got a little, like, metal hand gesture here. Yeah, you're sort of doing the, you know, horns horns thing. And then for the one person in the sentence all by itself, like, I arrive, the only thing acting, that's going to be on the thumb sticking out on its own. I like that because with I arrive, there's only one role happening there. The thumb kind of sticks out on its own. Right. The thumb is sort of its own solo player. We're just ignoring the middle and the ring fingers. That's a more complicated sentences for a future episode. There are certainly other things you can put in a sentence, and we're not going to look at those things slash fingers right now. Right. But the nifty thing about this metaphor, so again, we've got the index finger, which is the visitor, the picky finger, which is the visitee, and the arriving person uh, over here in the thumb. Arrivey. Arrivey. And so the thumb can touch the index finger, Mm -hmm. like when you're making an okay sign. Yeah. And that represents when you group together, I arrive and I visit the way English does. Yep. Those are pattering together. And you have the pinky finger that's all by itself doing its own thing. That's me. And then you can also have the thumb touch flat against the pinky finger. Yep. This represents when the arrivee and the visitee are doing the same thing. So that would be visit me and me arrive Yeah, in a language that's something like that. And then the index finger is all by itself and it's doing its own thing. So it's doing, for example, I. You know what? It's a lot more awkward for me to touch my index finger and my pinky finger together. Right. And those don't really touch together very well. You can kind of brush the sides a bit, um, but they don't touch flat as easily as the thumb does. And that represents how you really don't want to mark the two roles in the same sentence with the exact same marking, because then you don't know who's visiting who. Defeats the purpose of distinguishing who's doing what in a sentence. Right. So this is our sort of visual metaphor using something that hopefully everybody has access to. Unfortunately, uh, the enthusiasm budget does not stretch to billboards. No, but it does stretch to hoping that people have hands. Yes. The other thing that's nifty about your metaphor, Gretchen, is that okay is a meaningful gesture in English in a way Mm -hmm. that touching the thumb and pinky together is not. So you know the way that they line up in English is for the thumb and the index finger to go together. I arrive and I visit Gretchen. Oh, because yeah, that's a gesture that we have. I can't guarantee that all of the cultures that do have the okay handshake <laughs> do have this uh, exact morphosyntactic alignment. It only works if you're trying to remember things for an exam in English. And the other thing that's the case, at least for me, is I find it's a bit easier and more comfortable to tap my thumb to my index finger than to tap my thumb to my pinky. And I feel like this represents as a mnemonic how this grouping of the visitor and the arrivee together is a bit more common Hmm. cross-linguistically. The other one is still in a bunch of languages, and we're going to talk about that, but it's a bit more common to have the index and the thumb grouped together. The other thing I really like about this is that putting the pinky and the thumb together is now like cool new linguist greeting. (laughs) Yeah, so okay already has a meaning, but the pinky thumb together, this could be a cool new linguistic hand shape gesture. You could do a little tappity tap of your thumb against your index and your pinky finger in succession. And you could use this as a cool hand gesture to flag down linguists in public. Are you a fan of morphosyntactic alignment? Yeah, it's like the live long and prosper gesture for <laughs> linguistics. <laughs> I love it. Or if you're if you're at a bar and you're trying to like find a discreet way of finding out if someone's a linguist and you like don't 
want to just ask them. I don't know why you wouldn't just ask them, but like you could do this little gesture. No, no, no. I, if you're at a bar and you want to find all the linguists in a noisy environment is what you're trying to say there. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. So I hope this catches on. I did just make this up. I can't guarantee other linguists will recognize it, <laughs> but maybe it seems pretty useful. So in English, we tend to keep the thumb and the index finger together. I visit Gretchen. I arrive. In other languages, you can have it as the thumb and the pinky together, and it's Gretchen visits me or me arrive. Exactly. And even though that's not the way it works in English, that is the way it works in other languages, and that is known as ergative. Well, so this whole thing is morphosyntactic alignment, and a part of this is ergativity. Mm -hmm. And specifically, we're used to doing this default OK sign, the index and thumb together. This has a name. It's called nominative accusative alignment because those are two different groups. And then the pinky and thumb together is called ergative absolutive alignment, but it often just gets shortened to ergativity because that's like the most salient piece of this entire edifice. Mm -hmm. And people tend to name the like most exciting bit. Of course, you've got to stick with the exciting bits, Gretchen. <laughs> <laughs> so when you have the thumb and pinky touching, the person who's visiting is left doing all of the work of packing their bags and getting on the flight. And the other people are just like, oh, I'm just here. I'm getting visited. Like, I arrive. Who knows how that happens? But the visitor has to do all of this stuff. And so the entity that's doing all the work is called the ergative. And the etymology of ergative, that erg there is from a Greek root that comes from the form ergon, which is work. Yeah. So an ergonomic chair is, I guess, a chair that sort of works well for you. Oh, huh. yeah. Makes sense. Or like the erg, which is pronounced slightly differently in syn -ergy, synergy, synergy, synergy. I guess it is synergy. <laughs> Working together. Working together. That's nice. Yeah. There's some real synergy to that etymology. <laughs> <laughs> and I think ultimately the Proto-Indo-European root, werg, a meaning to do, which is the origin of erg as in ergative and synergy, and also en also energy. Ah. Energy does the work. Is also the origin of the English word work. Cool. Yeah. That was a fun little etymological rabbit hole to go down. So the ergative, or to use an English root, the workative. The workative. <laughs> That would be so good. I should just call it the workative now. We already have enough going on here terminologically to not re-anglicize it. But it is one of those pieces of terminology that was created in the 20th century as part of this formalization of linguistic terminology. And that's why it has this Greek root and also kind of why it doesn't show up in other branches of sciences because we didn't borrow it from physics or biology. It was created within linguistics. Right. Whereas compared to something like morphology, which refers to the shape of words, but can also be used in like metals and geography, the shapes of other other things, ergative is specifically used for the grammatical concept and only the grammatical concept. So you really look like you know what you're talking about if you can use this word. So let's stop making up fake English ergatives and start looking at ergativity in some languages that actually have it as part of the grammar. And I think we'll just start with one of the poster children languages for ergativity, which is Basque. So Basque is a language that's spoken in Europe, but is not ancestrally related to any of the Indo-European languages. So it's not related to Spanish or Catalan or French or any of the languages that are spoken in that region of sort of Spain and France. And it's also not related to like Greek, which has this common ancestor with English, this work ergative erg connection. And so it sort of gets a lot of people very excited because it's a language that's convenient for people based in Europe to work on, uh, but is not related to the other languages in its neighborhood. Although, of course, it's done a certain amount of borrowing because of contact later. So first cool Basque fact, it's an isolate. Second cool Basque fact, it has ergative when most other European languages don't show anything like this. Third cool Basque fact is like you might expect for a language that is very different from all of the languages in its neighborhood, it's been undergoing language revitalization movements since like the 1970s and 1980s. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a lot more about that in a very soon upcoming episode. So stay tuned for way more about Basque. But as the poster child for ergativity, let's talk about what it specifically looks like. So for 
our verb arrived, it looks very much like English. If we're talking about Martin, Martin etori da, Martin has arrived. But if we have a verb that has two roles in it, in this example, we have Martin has seen Diego. We have Martinek Diego ikusidu. And here we have this ek on Martin. Right. Because you have the ek, which is the ergative marker on the one sort of solitary, there's Martin being his index finger all alone, compared to Martin with no marking on, on the end and Diego with no marking on the end, which are the other form that's called the absolutive, the one that isn't doing as much of the work. And that's the one that's not ergative. And those are the two forms that are sort of linked together, your pinky and your thumb touching each other. Mm -hmm. And we see exactly the same pattern in the language Aranda, which is from Central Australia in Northern Territory, where if a child is sitting, the child is marked as ampe, but if a child is chasing a dog, it's ampe le. So again, there's a suffix on the role that is doing something to something else. So that index finger is marked different from the pinky finger and the thumb. And then again, we see something that's very common with ergativity. And this sort of makes sense when you think of sort of an efficiency perspective. When you have just one role or one person, you know, the child, the dog, Martin, doing something all by itself, you don't mm -hmm. need to add anything to the end of it to indicate who's doing what to who. You can just say it and it's fine. Yeah. And it's the case when you have two different entities, you need to mark at least one of them so that you can tell who's doing what. And so you pick one to mark. And for languages that are ergative, you pick the one that's doing the action and you mark that one. The other one is unmarked. And then for implicitly for languages that are the other category that aren't ergative, you pick the one that's being acted upon to add the marking to. Although in English, that's less clear because we're sort of using word order and we're using these sort of relics of markings on the pronoun. So that's not as clear in this case. But in the poster child ergative languages, it's very clear that you have this one entity that's got a suffix on it or potentially a prefix or something like that. And then the other one just doesn't have any marking on it at all. You mentioned earlier that ergativity is not as common as the English style of marking. And I thought this was a really good reason to visit our new friend, Grand Bank and see in a big database of languages just how common each of these patterns were. So before we visit Grand Bank, let's just test our cross-linguistic intuitions. Do you think of ergativity as pretty common? Not that common? Like, what's your sense of it, just based on the languages you're familiar with? I think of it as pretty common, but I know I have a bit of an area bias because I work in Nepal, where there are a lot of languages that have ergative marking. And then being in Australia, a lot of my colleagues work on Australian languages and languages of Papua New Guinea, and it's relatively common in those language groups as well. Uh, so I think it's common, but I think that's my bias showing. Well, yeah, because my gut feeling about ergativity is it's not super common. Like I know it's in the Mayan languages. Uh, we just talked with Pedro Mateo Pedro and the Mayan languages that he works on all have ergativity. Mm -hmm. And in Basque, which I talked with someone else who we're going to have an interview about shortly. Okay, so based on Lingthusiasm episodes this year, incredibly strong preference for ergativity. <laughs> that might be the reason we decided we needed an ergativity episode, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say. <laughs> but other than that, I don't feel like I have a lot of like languages I could name off the top of my head that I'm like, oh yeah, that one's super ergative. Huh. Well, let's have a look at the numbers. There are around 1,900 languages in this part of the Grand Bank database, 150 of those they couldn't tell from the resources they had. So of the ones that are left, ergative is found in 390, and it's not found in around 13, 1400. So that's about 400 with ergativity and 1400 without ergativity. That's, you know, I would say quite a lot, not super common, but quite a lot, <laughs> which is about what we thought between us. The great thing about Grand Bank is that there is a little interactive map you can zoom in on. And when you zoom in, you can see that three real hotbeds of ergativity are the Nepal part of Southeast Asia, Australia, and then various little clusters in Papua New Guinea. So I was pretty spot on about my aerial bias. Yeah. And there's like some in Central America, but not a ton. So there's your Mayan languages. And you can certainly see where Basque is in a map of Europe because it is an ergative language in a sea of not ergative languages. There it is, right on the border of France and Spain. Ergativity is if we weren't having enough fun. More fun. Let's have more fun. So ergativity is also really neat because we've done basic ergativity, but it also shows up in different ways across different languages. 
It shows up in so many cool and different ways. And it's really one of those things like, if you've met one ergative language, you've met one ergative language. The thing with ergativity is, again, it's that sort of clustering of the pinky finger and the and the thumb roles in the sentence. But some languages have that clustering in some contexts, and the more cross-linguistically common clustering of the index finger and thumb together in other contexts. These are languages that flip between those two different hand gestures in different contexts. One of the reasons why the sort of exciting version of the phenomenon that gets talked about is ergativity rather than like nominativity, which is the Englishy pattern, is that there are lots of languages like English where you basically just have only these two entities patterning together. Hmm. But languages that are ergative are often partially ergative, or what they call split ergative. So again, that's the sort of exciting one, and they often have a little bit of the other system in there as well. And they can split in different ways, which is why it's fun to look at ergativity in each individual language, because they're often doing slightly different things. Do you have some examples of split ergative systems for us? I have so many examples of split ergative systems. I'm very excited to share with you. Uh, one that is actually common enough that the World Atlas of Linguistic Structures has different maps mm -hmm. is that some languages will do ergativity in pronouns, but not in common nouns or the other way around. So uh. Walls actually has different maps for whether a language is ergative in nouns or ergative in pronouns. I guess that sort of makes sense to me because English has, you know, pronouns change their shape depending on whether they're the subject or the object or something, mm -hmm. but our nouns just really do not change their shape. So you could imagine that, but for ergatives? Yeah, pronouns have their own history and way of being made, and they tend to kind of keep features for a long time, whereas you can add new suffixes to things all the time and change it up. So common nouns and pronouns can kind of go off on their own journeys, with one being ergative the other one being not. So that's one way that the split can happen. There's also splits that are based on meaning, which I really mm -hmm. find fascinating. Yeah. I have one here in a language called Dani from Papua New Guinea, which is where you are more likely to get something marked as ergative if it's an action that is uncommon. So if it's describing something that's like unexpected, yeah. then it's ergative. What would be an example of that? The example that I have from the class that I teach on syntax is – that it would be uncommon if you had a sentence like, the python ate the man, but it would be more common if you had a sentence like, the man ate the python. And so you wouldn't mark that second one as ergative. Okay, so in this culture, it is common for humans to eat pythons, but mercifully uncommon for pythons to eat humans. Yes. I feel like I've learned some interesting things about Dini culture as well. Yeah, I, I really like this one because what counts as uncommon surely varies quite a lot from culture to culture to linguistic context. I feel like I'm remembering this sort of saying about headlines where like, if a dog bites a man, that's not a newspaper headline. But if a man bites a dog, that is a newspaper headline. And you should mark it ergative. <laughs> <laughs> and that's interesting because in this case, it's the human biting the animal that's less common. So it's not just like a human, non-human animacy thing. It's really a, like, in this culture, humans don't bite dogs, but they do eat pythons. And again, it's the interesting case that gets this ergative marking added to it. Because the ergative is like the workative, so it's when you want to call attention to something that's doing a particular job. Another time you see a split across languages is depending on the tense of the verb, and you're more likely to hmm. get something that's split in a way where the ergative is in the past, and you have a non-ergative in present or future or however else the language segments up time. And Nepali is a language that has ergative in the past. Ah, okay. So what does that look like? So because it's Nepali, I use it as a chance to use momo in my examples, which are a delicious dumpling. Very delicious. So if I say, tomorrow my sister will eat momos. Okay, that's future. I would say, boli didi momo kancha. So didi mm -hmm. is sister, nothing marked there. But if I were to say, yesterday my sister ate momos, I would say he's your didi le momo kayo. Ah, so instead of didi, which is just sister without a marking, you have <laughs> didi le, which is sister plus ergative. And in both cases, momo is not marked. Yeah. So I assume maybe it's that they're in a certain word order that's telling you that your sister ate momos, and also that momos are this delicious dumpling that are not 
animate and can't go around eating your sister. Yes. What hopes? I guess if my sister was tragically eaten yesterday by a Momo, I would still mark it <laughs> as ergative, but only because it's in the past and nothing to do with how unusual that situation is. Okay. So you would need to mark Momo with an ergative because that sure is doing something, but not actually because of the surprise factor. No, because in the past with Nepali, and Nepali is an Indo-Aryan language, so it is part of this larger Indo-European family, but on a completely different end of the geographic spectrum to English because it's in Nepal. Do we know why Nepali has an ergative, even though most of the other Indo-European languages don't? I don't know what the exact mechanism is, but there are a whole bunch of features of Nepali that are very similar to languages from other families in the area, including the Tibeto-Burman languages that I work with. So it's possibly some kind of contact influence happening there. That makes sense. So we have ergative for nouns and pronouns. Mm -hmm. We have ergative for unusual events. We have ergative for past. Any more kinds of split ergative systems? So everything we've talked about so far is very much if it's this form, do this. If it's this form, do that. So if it's a pronoun, do this. Or if it's a past tense, do this. There are ergative systems where it's not a hard and fast rule of the grammar. It all depends on the context. And these are called optional systems. Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> and the languages that I work with have these optional systems. So you can't make a grammatical rule that's like, in the past, you must use ergative or you must use ergative with pronouns. Instead, what happens is if you look across a corpus, sometimes you'll get ergative, sometimes you won't, and it really depends on like a range of different factors. So do they have to do with trying to emphasize who's doing the work? Yeah, they touch on some of the things we've talked about so far. So you are more likely to get an ergative in the past because something has very clearly been done, the, the work, the active role has been done you're much more likely to get it with something that was intentional. Okay, sure. Or that is unusual. You also get things like you're more likely to have ergative if it's not a habitual action, if it's a slightly unusual or uncommon action that someone's performing. Okay. Or if they're more animate. So you're more likely to get ergative with a human than an animal and more likely with an animal than something like a tree. <laughs> Makes sense. But this is not 100% of the time. You need to collect a really large corpus of people talking about all kinds of different contexts to see where you're more likely to get an ergative or not. And this also sounds like it has potential to be somewhat cultural because mm -hmm. what people think of as a habitual action or what people usually do versus less commonly do seems like it would have some relationships with culture. And this is also why it's really important to not just give people a bunch of sentences to read and translate. Because if I give people a list of sentences to read and translate, they'll just give the ergative in all the situations where you have someone acting on something else. So where you would expect there to be that index finger role acting on something else. But then you hear a story and you're like, where did that ergative go? Oh. And it's because it's being used optionally and strategically which makes it very cool and fun to try and figure out the patterns. So when I nerd sniped you nine years ago into writing a blog post and updating the Wikipedia article about ergative, I was really like touching into something that was very near and dear to your heart. Indeed. And since then, I've also written the entire Yolmo language page in much more detail that also touches on a little bit of this ergative structuring. Excellent. While we're talking about ways that you could organize how you know who does what to who, you know, you can group the person who's by themselves in a sentence with only one role with the one side of the verb with two or with the other side of the verb with two. But in principle, you don't actually need to make it pattern with anything. You could have a system that has all three different roles marked in three different ways. Does that ever happen? It does indeed. It's known as a tripartite system because there are three parts, each doing their own thing. Do you have an example of a language that does that? Conveniently, I have one from Wonkamara, which is a language of Queensland in Australia. And they have three different pronouns depending on what role is in the sentence. Oh, okay. Very neat. So for something like I arrived, our thumb form would be Nani. Okay. For the I in I visited you, it would be Nkatu. Okay. 
In English, they're just both I, but they're both different. But then if it was you visiting me, instead of me, it's ngangha. So it's three different pronouns for the three different roles. So nyangi, ngkatu, and nyangha, Mm -hmm. like three different forms. So, you know, none of the fingers are touching each other. You know, I think we could do this in pseudo-English if we wanted to. We would just have to invent an extra pronoun form. Yeah, that makes sense. So we could have like, I visit them, they visit me, but then like, mo arrives and tho arrives. Excellent. And those, you'd have like, I, me, and mo, they, them, and tho, or something like this. And that would be your extra form all by itself doing its own thing in the sentence where it's the only one. I love that if you hold up your thumb, index, and pinky and make sure none of them touch each other, you can make the I love you gesture that's based on the ASL form of the verb I love you. It's like, I love you tripartite systems. (laughs) That is really great. (laughs) I love the tripartite system so much. I'm making the I love you handshape. So while we're on linguistic phenomena that are a little bit complicated but have really cool names. Okay, are we into the deepest ergative deep cut that we can make? The deepest ergative deep cut has one of my favorite names of a grammatical phenomenon ever, and we have to talk about it because it just sounds so cool. Okay. In English, we have, uh, you can have a sentence like Gretchen visited Slorin, which is the Mm -hmm. active sentence. And you can also have a version of that where you put more emphasis on the visitee by having Lauren is visited by Gretchen. And that's the passive version of the sentence. We're moving fingers around on hands here. We're moving fingers around on hands here. So you can sort of promote that visity person to a more prominent position for reasons of emphasis. Thankfully, the Lingthusiasm budget does not extend to hand surgery. So you're just going to have to imagine the fingers moving around. <laughs> yeah, whereas this is going to get a kind of gross uh, halloween metaphor here. <laughs> But in ergative languages, because of the ways that the subject and object relate are different, instead of having a passive, we have an anti-passive. Yeah. And I think there should be more specialized terminology that begins with anti, because I feel like it's like having antimatter, but for linguistics. See, I always think of like anti-pasto share plates Mm. when I hear anti-passive, and they're delicious. So I have positive feelings towards the anti-passive. The delicious platter with olives and artichokes and cured meats on it. I don't want to go straight from cured meats to fingers, but I can explain (laughs) how the anti-passive works if we like. Okay, just give us the brief anti-passive rundown while we're here, because I think it's such a cool piece of terminology. So I'll do a translated example from Dirabal, which is a language spoken in Queensland in Australia, because this is the first language the antipassive was described for, so it shows up in a lot of examples. Okay. So if a man was cutting the tree, we have man and tree, and it's an ergative sentence, so the index finger man is marked ergative, it's distinct and different. Gotcha. In the same way with a passive, you get rid of focusing on one of the fingers in the sentence. We can get rid of the tree and just have the man was cutting. But in Dirabal, you can't have the man still be ergative because now there's only one thing that's in the sentence. And so you have to make the man, even though he's still cutting, and we think of cutting as having two things, we now make it look like the non-ergative, so that absolutive. So it looks like a thumb and is therefore more focused. So in the same way that in a non-ergative language like English, you can have Gretchen visits Lauren or I visit them. You can change that into the passive by going Lauren is visited. Yeah. And there you are all by yourself Yes. in the sentence or they are visited. There you are all by yourself in a sentence. Yeah. And in this case, the man was cutting the tree, instead of promoting the tree and going, the tree was being cut, which you'd be do if it was a passive, you mm-hmm. have the man was cutting, but now you have to take the ergative off the man because otherwise he was previously being marked with ergative. Yes. And in a language like Dirabal, it's completely normal sounding in a way that a passive sounds normal in English, even though you've gotten rid of one of the roles because you've changed the marking. It makes complete sense. It sounds very grammatical. And it just makes the man even more of a focus. And what is being cut is less of a focus. And so in the way that a passive gets rid of the original subject, 
the anti-passive makes the original subject like subject plus plus. That's why it's anti-passive. If you put a passive and an anti-passive in the same sentence, would it cause an explosion? <laughs> so we've talked about all of these like interesting ergativity can sort of pop up in various little bits of the grammar in different languages. But what if I were to tell you that there's actually a little teeny tiny bit of English that is actually ergative? It was here all along. <laughs> the ergativity was inside the house all along. <laughs> uh, please share. Okay. So you know how in English we have like a double E ending mm -hmm. that goes on certain nouns. So you can have things like retiree or escapee or employee. We've had devotee and arrivee in this episode so far. That's true. So this is a thing that goes on nouns, but they're all nouns that come from a verb. And so if you have a verb like employ, and if you say Gretchen employs Lauren, then Lauren is the employee. Employee of the month, I would hope. <laughs> I don't actually employ you, but you are the employee <laughs> of the month in my heart. Oh, thanks. <laughs> And the same thing is if I visit you, you're the visitee. If I pay you, you're the payee. Mm -hmm. If I nominate you, you're the nominee, and so on. So there are two roles in this sentence. Right. And the one that is acted upon is the one that when you make it into a noun with E, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. But there's another set of verbs that you can also use E with. If we decide that we want to retire from making lingthusiasm, which we have no intention to do, but we would then be retirees. Mm -hmm. And we're the only entity in this action. You know, Gretchen is a retiree. Lauren is a retiree. Yep. I have retired. You have retired. I'm not retiring you. So there's only one role. I've got my thumb and that's marked with this E. Yeah. If you were trying to escape, you could be an escapee. True. And it's not like I escape you, it's just you escape. Now you're an escapee. And again, so here's this thumb and here's this pinky that can both get the E marking on them. Wait a second, that's my ergative hand shape, Gretchen. That's my ergative hand shape that employee and retiree and escapee and visitee, arrivee all get the E marking on them. Mm -hmm. And the one that's left over that's the exception is things like employer and visitor and nominator, these ones that do the action that are the ergative ones that are doing the work, huh. did all the work of nominating you. <laughs> that's the one that has the or ending, which is the ergative one. There we go. There was a tiny bit of ergativity in English all along. And we should note that not all words that end in E are examples of this particular phenomenon in English. Okay. So, you know, you have mentor and mentee, but you don't have, for example, chimpanzor and chimpanzee. <laughs> Chickador and chickadee. Okay, that is definitely looking for morphology that is not there. Frisbore and frisbee, come on! <laughs> the frisbore is the person that throws the frisbee. <laughs> And then the frisbee is the one that receives it. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that is definitely some interesting morphological reanalysis there. <laughs> I think it works great, but you know, it doesn't. It doesn't happen for every instance of the e ending, but it does happen in a bunch of them. And so here's this example of a tiny, tiny way in which English has a split ergative system. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on all the podcast platforms or lingthusiasm.com. You can get transcripts of every episode on lingthusiasm.com slash transcripts, and you can follow at lingthusiasm on all the social media sites. You can get scarves with lots of linguistics patterns on them, including IPA, branching tree diagrams, booba and kiki, and our favorite esoteric Unicode symbols, plus other Lingthusiasm merch like our new Etymology Isn't Destiny t-shirts, and aesthetic IPA posters at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. My social media and blog is Superlinguo. Links to my social media can be found at gretchenmcculloch.com, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now, or if you just want to help keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, 
or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Recent bonus topics include what I learned at Linguist Summer Camp, how we make the Lingthusiasm transcripts, and doing linguistic fieldwork. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language, especially this month in honor of our seventh anniversary. The Lingthusiasm survey is open till December 15th, 2023, anywhere on Earth, and it's available at bit.ly slash Lingthusiasm Survey 23. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn. Our editorial producer is Sarah Dopierella. Our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Billens. And our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!